Okay, so good morning, uh, everyone. I think we can uh, commence our webinar. So uh, firstly, let me introduce myself. I'm Alan Barrett, uh, the director uh, of the ESRI, and it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody here uh, this morning to our conference on national statuses for migrants uh, in need of protection, Ireland and the EU. Uh, so just a, a small bit of background. Um, as many of you know, the, uh, the European Migration Network is exactly that. It's a network of national contact points uh, across the European Union. The goal of all the national contact points is to provide a sort of harmonized information on uh, migration and asylum issues across Europe. Uh, in Ireland, um, delighted to say that the, the national contact point of the EMN is, relate, is uh, located at the, uh, the ESRI. And it's in that context this morning then that we're going to have our, uh, our, our webinar. So we're getting more used to these things. Uh, I, I suppose the Institute have been running a, a few of these events in, in recent times. The downside is we regret uh, that there aren't more, you know, we don't get a chance to sort of see you all uh, in person and have uh, conversations at, at coffees and things like that. But uh, the upside is that uh, we realize it's a lot more convenient actually for people to attend uh, these events. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that some of you are watching Watching this from your back gardens uh, this morning, and uh, look, look at you if, if that's what you're doing, uh, and that, that's a, a really good idea. So we've got four uh, great speakers uh, th this morning. I'll, I'll introduce each one as as we go along. Uh, presentations will be about. Uh, 20 minutes and we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end and just to let you know uh, if you want to submit questions if you can use the Q&A function so if you just hover uh, the cursor uh, over the screen you'll see uh, icons arising at the, uh, at the bottom and uh, the Q&A uh, function will allow you to submit questions and uh, so after all the presentations uh, we'll, we'll try and um, get a question and answer session going I'll, I'll try and moderate that so um, the first thing I'm actually going to do this morning before we get to the speakers I'm just going to invite uh, my colleague Emma Quinn so Emma has many of you will know uh, heads EMN with, within the SRI and uh, I just want to give Emma a, a, a minute or two uh, again to, to welcome everybody so over to you Emma. Hello yes uh, just a few words of welcome um, to, to thank you all for your interest in the in the seminar um, we have a hundred people uh, registered and we're also streaming on on YouTube so there's been a great deal of interest and I think that reflects the importance of the topic that we're going to be discussing today I'd like to particularly thank the speakers. I know this is a really uh, busy time for, for very many people, so we really do appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to join us today. Um, so yeah, um, I'm looking forward to a good discussion at the end, and also hopefully before uh, too long, to, to meeting again in person. Right, many thanks for that, Emma. Um, so the, the format, as I said, we, we've got four presentations and just to give you a, a small bit of background. Um, so the European Migration Network, this is the entire uh, network uh, across the EU and Norway, uh, produces a sort of an ongoing series uh, of, of reports. And very often when we run these events, uh, what we do is we, we start off with the uh, an overview of the, 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 the report that has been compiled across Europe. Uh, and we'll come to that study first. Then we look at the Irish uh, specific report that was done. And again, obviously that sort of uh, brings us into a little bit more focus. Uh, but the other thing we're always eager to do in these sort of events is, is bring perspectives from policymakers and NGOs and others uh, who are sort of working at the coalface of these issues. Uh, so we've that sort of str very strong link uh, between the sort of the more, you know, academic study based uh, work and then the more practitioner side as well. So I think today we've got a, a great blend of, of four speakers uh, across uh, that group. So with that, I want to invite our, our, our first speaker. First speaker is Tatiana Kiskruga. And Tatiana is a senior consultant with ICF. And the importance of ICF is that they are the group uh, who work with the EMN, uh, who, who have this terribly difficult job uh, always of, of taking 27, 28 uh, studies, whatever it is, and trying to sort of distill some sort of a coherent um, message from them. So it's, it's, it's always a, a, a difficult task, but they always do it remarkably well. Uh, so Tatiana is going to give us this overview uh, of, of the European situation. Uh, on this this question of the national protection statuses. Uh, so with that, uh, Tatiana, can I ha hand over to you? 
And uh, as we discussed early, you've, you've got about 20, 25 minutes, but uh, with about five minutes to go, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just intervene to you know if that's the case. So over to you, Tatiana. Well, thank you very much, Alan, for the presentation. Um, I will try to share my screen and to share the presentation. I hope this is seen. Um, yeah, that's perfect, Tatiana. Thanks. Yep, thank you. <laughs> So as um, as you um, uh, introduced, um, I, I am indeed working for the service provider. We have indeed a very interesting task to um, prepare um, a, a couple of studies per year. So normally the network uh, prepares roughly four uh, studies per year on various focused studies um, or on thematics. And uh, one of them um, for 2019 was um, this comparative overview of national protection statuses. And I had the pleasure of being one of the co-leads of the study and I'm very very happy to, to present it today um, because the uh, study was published I think yesterday so it's very fresh out of the oven and um, so uh, very happy to, to go with it. Um, I hope uh, how uh -huh. So just a very quick uh, overview of how I want to present this today. I will first try to explain the, um, the methodology and the scope of the study. There are a few points there that I would like to highlight. Then to uh, go obviously on the uh, overview and typology of statuses um, that we found in the study. And then uh, to explain maybe what we meant by the comparative element and to, um, I hope to explain as well what, um, how to read the study. The study um, was meant to, to be a mapping exercise, but also to try to give some comparative elements. And I'll explain how we, um, we did that. And also, um, if time allows, uh, to also give an overview of what were the changes uh, observed since 2010. And um, as a network, we uh, also uh, uh, prepare a number of promotional uh, videos for, for each study. And I think uh, one of them uh, will, was prepared also for, for this study, if um, I'm giving it over <laughs> to technical <laughs> team. A new EMN study found that most EU member states and Norway have at least one form of national protection based on domestic law and policy. For example, protection may be granted for humanitarian reasons or on the basis of the principle of non refoulement which prohibits states from returning individuals to a country where they would be at risk. Some states have adopted specific statuses for persons suffering from a serious medical condition, victims of climate change and natural disasters, unaccompanied minors, and resettled refugees. The procedures for granting these national protection statuses vary. Applications may be examined as part of a single procedure together with the asylum claim or in a separate procedure. The criteria for national protection are often largely undefined and subject to the discretion of national authorities. The type of rights granted to people with a national protection status also vary among member states. For example, with regard to duration of residence or access to the labor market and social assistance. 25 European countries have conducted a study on their national protection statuses. These studies are summarized in an EU synthesis report. Want to know more? Check out the full report on the EMN website. Um, I'll continue with the presentation. 
ông. Yes, I uh, hope everyone sees it um, and hears me. Okay. So um, that was a great presentation, I think, to give you a very um, overall overview of what the study is about. Um, what I wanted to maybe use the time and the opportunity today is to also explain a bit what uh, stood behind the, the methodology of the study uh, and also um, to properly explain uh, the, the scope um, of the study because I think this will explain also how we did it um, together with, uh, with the network. So um, as we uh, said, so the, the study was based on the contributions from a total of 25 um, national contact points. Uh, you can see there um, uh, highlighted in the map now, um, what we uh, wanted to also explain was that uh, the um, the synthesis report was aimed to be um, initially um, as a as an update of the 2010 Yemen study on um, non-EU harmonized um, statuses, and we wanted to check whether you know in in the past 10 years anything changed. What has changed? Uh, you know whether statuses have have still, um, you know, still there. Um, also in light of uh, the um, common European asylum system harmonization, whether this has brought any changes. So these were a number of underlying assumptions that we wanted to test with this study. Um, however, what we um, I wanted to highlight here was um, the geographic scope of the study is not exactly the same. So there are a bit more um, uh, member states that participated and countries that participated in this study than in the 2010 study. So this is one element if um, readers want to compare the two studies. Um, so for instance, Norway, Luxembourg and Cyprus uh, were not part of the 2010 study. In the 2000, in the, the present study, however, for instance, Germany was, did not participate. So this is also something uh, to, to take into account when, when reading um, the study. Um, another point was on the scope of what we meant by national protection statuses. So I think the national one is pretty much understood. So it's uh, statuses that um, are not harmonized at EU level, so not a uh, refugee or uh, subsidiary protection. Um, and then we also uh, tried to explain a bit more what we meant by protection as well. So some of the statuses that were covered in 2010 study are not reflected, um, were not taken on board simply in the 2010 study. Uh, for instance, state, uh, stateless people, um, but also victims of trafficking and of crime. We felt that this type of um, um, statuses or at least residence permits and grounds were not necessarily protection wise, but also because they had a very specific um, um, body of legislation at international law and or in a EU level that defined those categories. So this is, um, um, I hope this was clear as a, as a first introduction on the methodology. Um, I will now um, go to uh, present um, so the overview and uh, of the statuses that we uh, found in the study. Um, Obviously, what this was one of the, the interesting parts of the study was to find um, and try to classify the different um, statuses. There, there we came up with uh, nine different categories. Obviously, we can always discuss those and I'm happy to answer any questions on you know, the rationale of those. I'll try to present uh, very briefly how we, we thought those. So we had, um, uh, if we, we try to compare it with uh, the international um, and EU uh, refugee law, uh, you have the refugee status that was there and, bef and then you also have the subsidiary protection. So if you, um, and also you know, some, some forget also about it, there's also the temporary protection directive, which was never used, but nonetheless, there's this element of collective protection. So um, th that's why we first had the constitutional asylum, um, so these are these are statuses um, or at least type of protection that pre-existed um, most of the time before the Geneva Convention uh, on refugees um, and or um, so, so we wanted to test whether these are still um, out there and to what extent they are still distinct from um, from the refugee status. Um, the collective protection, as I said, um, is uh, maybe a national form of uh, the temporary protection directive. Um, so in the few member states still subsisted. And then we had this big group of humanitarian grounds. What we tried to understand, obviously, with the study is that 
um, human, the, the distinction between subsidiary protection and humanitarian grounds can be very difficult to assess and there is obviously a lot of um, case law still at um, uh, before the Court, of Europe, uh, the, the Court of Justice of the European Union about this, but um, we tried to disentangle this a bit and try to explain at least to to, to, to see what, were, what was understood be, behind these humanitarian grounds and also to understand uh, you know, what, what was the level of protection and which authorities were involved. So as you see uh, from, from this uh, nice table, what we found out is that, um, and this was said in the, in the video, is that um, out of the 25 um, states that participated to the study, uh, 21 had at least one national protection status. So, there still exist. However, um, not uh, in some member states, as you see with the dots, in some member states they're a bit more active than in others. So for instance, Belgium um, and, and Netherlands have more than two statuses, which is quite interesting to also to, to see. And uh, I invite you to also uh, then look at the national reports, national contributions to, to understand the situation there. And um, that's that's a horizontal reading of, of the table but then when we also look um sorry a vertical reading and then if we look um, um horizontally at which let's say statuses are more present than others so we had um i'm sorry my neighbors are making some noise um there is um there was a first group that was just so to speak a general humanitarian grounds um so an sort of an umbrella status that was there in in um in national legislation and it was um, it was not necessarily defined in some cases um, it was explained what was uh, behind what was meant by humanitarian statuses uh, humanitarian grounds and we tried to explain that in in the in the study and sometimes it was just a fail-safe um, sort of um, uh, protection ground that was there in case a person did not qualify for refugee or subsidiary protection um, obviously, medical reasons uh, is there, um, and um, uh, then then also the non reformable principle. Exceptional circumstances, you would wonder what this uh, stood for. So, exceptional circumstances, um, in some cases, um, they they run in parallel um, with human, what we would call general humanitarian grounds, um, or um, they were really um, we tried to understand why they were so exceptional. So that's why it's a separate category. Um, in the tape. So moving forward, um, another question that we wanted to uh, to test with this study was: so we have we know that um, so if I ex go back to this slide, this slide explains which type of statuses or which type of grounds, protection grounds are there in legislation. So they exist in legislation, the national protection framework, but to what extent they're actually used? So to the um, extent possible, we try to find cues um, based on the national um, reports, but also from Eurostate data to try to understand uh, to what extent, for instance, you know, just one assumption was uh, where they used, uh, where these statuses used more often than refugee or subsidiary protection during the refugee crisis. So this was one of the questions uh, we tried to um, at least to explore. I'm not saying that the answer was clear cut. Um, uh, because, for instance, if we look at Eurostat data, uh, Eurostat data is one of the proxies that we used to to understand um, this um, this dimension that I just mentioned. And um, what we can see from Eurostat data is that at least there are two main countries. So, for instance, Germany and and Italy um, use um, let's say issued authorizations to stay for humanitarian reasons quite often um, in the past 10 years uh, or nine years. And uh, interestingly, in 2019, uh, you see there is a bar there um, with other member states that actually is, is quite high. And um, the majority of those statuses is actually was, were issued by, um, by Spain. So it's also interesting to see the trends and how member states use that, um, uh, use those provisions. Um, maybe another point um, as a very huge disclaimer here before I go forward is um, Eurostat data definition of, and that's why um, we use the term authorizations to stay for humanitarian reasons, is that um, the, um, the definition used by Eurostat is a bit more restrictive um, than, uh, I mean, not just a bit, quite more, quite, quite restrictive than uh, the definition that we had of national protection statuses in our study. Um, meaning, for instance, they um, generally counted um, among um, among um, in, in, in their data, persons who were former asylum seekers. So definitely those who already went through um, the uh, asylum procedure. 
I will explain that later, but uh, some of the national protection statuses that we cover in the study were not necessarily um, uh, just persons who uh, applied um, for international protection before. Uh, maybe a, just an interesting point, uh, if we look also at national data, again, I, I, um, I refer to the national reports, but we try to explain that or at least to show um, information where, where it was available. Um, for instance, um, in Sweden, it was quite interesting that the exceptional um, status, uh, this exceptional circumstances status was quite used. I think it was the third reason. Um, I think they issued um, something like um, 11,000 um, statuses um, in a year. So it, 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 quite, it was quite an interesting one. Um, statuses like uh, constitutional asylum are very seldom, seldomly used. Um, collective protection was used at some point um, in 2014-15. Um, but it was completely abolished, for instance, in the Netherlands. Um, and then uh, I think medical reasons, um, the medical grounds status is, is used sporadically, not very often, but it's, it's, uh, it's still there. So it's just to give you also a, a sense of, you know, a bit more practical whether um, national protection statuses are, are, are used uh, by uh, member states. Um, now, if I um, just looking at the time, I still have five more minutes. Um, if I look a bit on, I uh, wanted to to spend a bit of time here, showcasing what we meant by um, the comparative overview uh, of the of the um, of the study. So as explained uh, before, so we had the different grounds of protection. So we tried to classify those um, in the different types uh, or categories um, that we felt could be grouped together and to see how member states would approach um, the ground or the type of content of protection that they would grant. So this is one element of, of, of comparison. Another element of comparison obviously is what we um, call the determination procedures. So it's to understand um, the margin of discretion left to, to, to national authorities when uh, they examine um, this type of um, uh, grounds of protection. So this is where, for instance, to understand whether, you know, if a status is within, um, let's say, um, within a single procedure, so at the same time as another international protection um, claim, um, this would give an indication uh, as to which authorities, what are also, you know, the appeal procedures, uh, just to understand um, the safeguards around the procedure and to what extent, you know, there is a, there is a discretion um, left to, or not, to, to national authorities. And then, uh, for each status, uh, where I mean, where um, the information was um, was allowing it, we tried to put together um, a table. So we felt that this table could be read, um, you know, for each status, to also explain, you know, the different what exactly we mean by content of protection, and to also. Um, perhaps in the entice uh, readers to actually look into the different um, elements and see what are the uh, the differences between uh, between um, between a certain group um, and then maybe just to to uh, to also highlight that there is an annex to the study that was prepared uh, together uh, with uh, the European Asylum um, Support Office which actually looks at um, showcases at the level of protection granted by, um, so for refugee and subsidiary protection by member states. So the, the exercise, if readers want to do it, um, is to at least allow the possibility to look at how, you know, national protection status um, by a certain member state, uh, what was the level of protection compared to within that member state judiciary protection. In most uh, of the cases, the interesting, uh, let's say, benchmark is to look at the subsidiary protection, um, but um, it's also interesting to, to look also at how uh, certain member states implemented the refugee protection. So just to um, highlight that there is also the annex that we are very grateful to, um, to the support that we received from uh, EASO to, uh, to, to produce it. And I think it's a very interesting addition to, to the study and I haven't seen this exercise done in, in um, uh, a lot of publications. Then um, what we uh, tried to also uh, showcase in the last section of the study was, as I said from the beginning, was to see the difference since 2010 what were the debates, what happened on these national protection statuses. Um, so also to see to what extent, uh, 
you know, new ones appeared. Uh, why? Um, what were it was where, where what were the drivers behind it? And um, you know, if there are new statuses considered um, by um, by certain countries in the future. So as you see from this um, uh, small map and um, a figure that we tried to to categorize between three strands. So to see in member states which still brought some changes to their uh, existing statuses and to let's say in to what extent and on what uh, on uh, for what grounds so for instance uh, you could see that Belgium has significantly amended its own humanitarian um, uh, grounds um, in uh, so for medical grounds and I think they classified under exceptional circumstances in some member states they also abolished statuses so for instance Finland um, abolished its own humanitarian protection the old one in 2016 under the reason that um, they felt, at least the government felt, that the uh, the, the the humanitarian protection status was um, aligned with the subsidiary protection, and that there was no reason to to grant an, a national protection status. And um, in other member states, what was also interesting, uh, and again um, uh, highlighting the case of Sweden. Sweden was, uh, as you all may be uh, aware, um, they adopted the Temporary um, Act in 2016 that had a number of consequences on uh, how they approach, um, um, well, their, their subsidiary protection statuses, but also national protection ones. And so you would see Sweden um, at every time explaining that these statuses ex exist, but uh, since 2016 and until 2021, um, the existing national protection status is listed in the study are suspended so they are not uh, granted um, another um, country I wanted to highlight at the moment um, Tatiana maybe five, uh, three more minutes yes wrapping up and so the last country I wanted to uh, to highlight was Italy Italy is a very interesting case um, because they uh, in 2018 so in October 2018 they completely uh, overhauled their um, their national framework on humanitarian protection so instead of having one uh, status they divided in uh, four different ones so uh, we tried to make the distinction between these cases in the study but I would also invite you to look at um, the national uh, report to to understand better you know the the context and how um, how the, the the reform was carried I will stop here uh, thank you again for your time uh, and I hope you uh, this presentation will give you um, will give you some uh, incentive to look at the study and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, thank you again. Great, thanks so much for that. Um, I, I did sort of say at the start that it's tremendously difficult to, uh, to bring you know, the diverse uh, nature uh, of the studies and the systems together, but you did it brilliantly. And actually some of your slides uh, were uh, impressive to say the least, uh, just in terms of the amount of cross-national uh, information you included. So uh, I presume we'll do, as we always do with ESRI events, we, we'll add the slides uh, later. So I know the slides might be available in the, in the report, but it might assist people uh, if they can go directly uh, to them because they were, they, they were just tremendous. So thanks for setting up the, uh, the issues from uh, that sort of broad perspective. So um, if, if you wanna stop uh, sharing the screen then, and we'll move over to the, the next presentation. So uh, this is now going to be Sarah Brock and Patricia Brazil uh, who are going to present the uh, the Irish uh, specific dimension of the study that you were just learning about. So uh, I understand, uh, Sarah, you're, you're going to kick off and then Patricia's going to come in um, after you. So uh, yeah. over to you. Thanks, Alan. So as Alan mentioned, um, Patricia and I have been working over the past year um, to draft the Irish report that accompanies the EU-wide study um, on national protection statuses. Um, and I'd just like to thank Patricia for working on this report with us um, over the past year, as well as to thank the Department of Justice and Equality, UNHCR, uh, the Irish Refugee Council, and the reviewers who gave their time to provide input at various stages of the drafting and review of the study. So the Irish report looks at statuses that have sole basis in Irish law. So aside from refugee status and subsidiary protection that Tatiana has mentioned, uh, as being um, regulated at EU level. Um, so in light of the fact that over the past few years, new routes um, to protection have been established in Ireland and a new protection framework was introduced in 2015, this study gave us the opportunity to look at the kinds of national statuses in place in Ireland to respond to protection needs, the schemes under which they are granted and how the rights granted to people with these national statuses compare 
the rights granted to people with refugee status or subsidiary protection. So in this presentation, I'm going to quickly recap on the statuses in place at EU level and their place in Irish law. And I'll present some data we gathered on the statuses in Ireland. Um, and then I'll first discuss programme refugee status, um, which is one of the three statuses we have um, put um, together in this presentation that were addressed in the Irish report. And then I'll hand over to Patricia, who will speak about permission to remain under section 49 of the International Protection Act and leave to remain, which may be granted by the Minister for Justice in cases where a decision has been made not to make a deportation under on, uh, order under the Immigration Act 1999. And Patricia will then conclude with some points on the statuses in Ireland. So at EU level, um, as Tatiana mentioned, um, just to briefly mention that we have international protection, which comprises refugee status, uh, which is based, of course, on the UN Refugee Convention, and we also have the EU-developed uh, subsidiary protection status. And these statuses are governed by the Qualification Directive, which was first um, adopted in 2004 to establish common criteria that apply to each EU member state um, for granting these statuses, and as well as the rights to which beneficiaries of these statuses are entitled. And this um, directive was later amended in 2011 to further harmonise statuses um, at EU level. Now, just to note, in Ireland, we have not opted into the amended directive, but we had opted into the first directive as it was adopted in 2004. So these provisions apply in Ireland, um, and these have been incorporated in Ireland through the International Protection Act 2015. And this act sets out the procedure for um, or through which a person may be granted international protection and how they can apply for this status. Um, and then, as Tatiana also mentioned, there's a third um, EU level status that's called temporary protection. And this was established for granting group um, protection in situations where a large number of displaced people arrived in the EU from a particular region or, or country. Now, this hasn't been um, used or activated at EU level, but it has been incorporated in Irish law in the International Protection Act as well. But for, for present purposes, the main EU statuses to remember are refugee status and subsidiary protection. So before going into detail on each national status, I just wanted to provide some data that we have on both the EU level statuses and the national statuses that have been granted in Ireland over the last 10 years. Um, so, first of all, we have refugee status um, and subsidiary protection in blue and red. And this presents the number of people that were granted international protection after having submitted an international protection application. Um, and they, these are granted at both first instance and on appeal. Then the orange bar, which is appearing now, is um, program refugee status. And this represents the number of people that have been resettled to Ireland in each year. Um, and who are accordingly granted um, what's called programme refugee status. And this has increased um, significantly in the last 10 years in light of um, new commitments made by the government to resettle increased numbers of people through various schemes in the last five years. Then the number, um, the bar in green, um, it shows the number of people who've been granted the status of permission to remain. And this was introduced in 2015 with the overall of the um, the overhaul of the Irish protection framework um, and it was first granted in 2017 um, and this as you can see has also increased since it was introduced and this forms part of the international protection process um, and Patricia will go into this um, in more detail later. Then finally in, in grey um, this bar shows the number of people who applied for international protection and received a negative decision but were subsequently granted leave to remain um, following a decision made by the Minister of Justice not to issue a deportation order against that person under the Immigration Act 1999. And this status was linked to the protection framework up until the 2015 Act was introduced. So it no longer um, applies to the protection, to people who come through the protection process, um, but it was an important status granted to people who, who applied for international protection. And again, Patricia will go through the status in more detail later. But ultimately, what we're trying to show with this graph is that a number of statuses um, at national level that are linked to the overall protection framework um, have been granted to people in Ireland. 
um, particularly in the last few years, and these supplement the primary statuses of refugee status and subsidiary protection. So moving on to the national statuses in more detail then, I'm going to first start off um, looking at programme refugee status. So this status, as I mentioned, is granted to people who are given permission to enter Ireland for the purposes of resettlement and protection through various programmes or schemes. Um, and since the 1950s, on an ad hoc basis, Ireland had been resettling groups of people fleeing war and conflict as programme refugees. Um, and in 1996, when the first Refugee Act um, was being introduced, and the Refugee Act was the first time a protection framework was introduced in Ireland and was the predecessor to the International Protection Act, there was a recognition when developing this Act that there needed to be uh, clarity provided on the status granted to people being resettled to Ireland and that this should be provide, um, based on a, a legal footing. So programme refugee status was established in the 1996 Act um, and at the same time um, provision was provided in 1996 um, formalising the basis on which um, the Minister for Justice and Equality in Ireland um, could uh, um, make agreements with UNHCR for the purpose of resettlement. And um, since then, with the introduction of the, of the 2015 Act, these provisions are mirrored in Section 59. So then there are various routes through which a person can be resettled or admitted to Ireland um, and granted programme refugee status. So the main programme here um, is Irish refugee, the Irish Refugee Resettlement Programme, which was um, established in 1998 by the Irish government in conjunction with UNHCR. Um, and this is the main program operating in the state um, with over 3,000 people having been resettled since 2000. Um, and since then, additional schemes have been introduced as part of broad commitments made by the government under the Irish Refugee Protection Programme in 2015 to admit people seeking need, in need of protection to Ireland through various schemes. So the first of these schemes is um, the Cali Special Project, which was established in 2016 for the purpose of um, bringing unaccompanied children who had been residing in the former migrant camp in Calais in France um, to Ireland for the purpose of protection. And these children were granted programme refugee status. Um, in November 19, or 2017 then, the government established the Irish Humanitarian Admission Programme or the IHAP. Um, and this allows people who are Irish citizens or have international protection in Ireland to apply to bring family members who um, are from the top 10 major refugee source countries um, to join them in Ireland. And people accepted under this programme are granted programme refugee status as well on arrival. Then finally, last year, the Community Sponsorship Initiative was launched at a national level. Um, and this involves individuals and organ local organisations coming together to sponsor refugee families uh, who are resettled to Ireland. And these families are also granted programme refugee status. So these are the main groups um, currently or um, recently um, in operation in Ireland through which people are granted programme refugee status. Um, and so the final slide um, I'll present on is then looking at the content of programme refugee protection. So the rights that programme refugees are entitled to as well as the types of supports that they receive on arrival in Ireland as well as following their resettlement in uh, local communities. So first note that generally programme refugees are granted similar rights and entitlements as people granted international protection. So programme refugees are entitled to seek and enter into um, employment, to access education and training, and receive the same medical care and social welfare as Irish citizens. Um, and these are set out in law. Um, then when we look at family reunification rights, so in the Irish protection framework, uh, refugees and subsidiary protection beneficiaries are entitled to apply to have their family members um, join them in Ireland after receiving status. Um, however, for programme refugees, this is not set out in legislation, this right to apply for family to come and join them in Ireland. However, in practice, the Department of Justice and Equality do accept and process applications for reunification on the same basis as refugees and subsidiary protection holders. And lastly, um, as part of the resettlement framework um, and different schemes that have been set up in recent years, people resettled to Ireland are provided with 
a variety of orientation and integration support following their arrival. Um, and the programme through which a person has been resettled to Ireland um, will determine the way in which these supports are provided. So, for example, the, the main uh, government-led resettlement programme, um, people are initially housed in emergency reception and orientation centres um, for a temporary period, um, which can vary um, depending on um, the, their circumstances. And before being housed, that they're then housed in independent accommodation around the country. And during this time, a specific orientation programme is provided um, to people resettled. Then programme refugees arriving in Ireland under the Community Sponsorship Initiative are housed on arrival in the destination community um, immediately following arrival in the country. Um, and this is provided by the sponsorship group um, and the sponsorship group lead on assisting families in providing orientation support and, and connecting those families with central state services at local level. So I could go into much more detail at this stage on these various programmes and I know Evelyn Byrne who is here from the um, Irish Refugee Protection Programme may will go through these programmes in more detail. So I'm conscious of time and I'll hand over to Patricia who will um, continue on with the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Sarah. So. Um, just to pick up then, um, it was a pleasure to, to work on the support with everybody, um, both at the domestic level and also with Tatiana and her team on the, uh, the overarching report. Um, I was going to address just some of the specific, um, other, the other specific pathways for protection at the national level outside of the EU framework, um, starting with section 49 of the International Protection Act of 2015. As Sarah has mentioned, this, was a, a rel this is a relatively new status in Irish law. Um, which was introduced as part of uh, a significant reform in introducing a single protection procedure in Ireland, which we didn't have until uh, the International Protection Act of 2015. So the Section 49 permission to remain uh, applies where a person has applied for international protection now as part of the single protection procedure. The, determin the determination procedure as set out in, in the statute is that a person's application for refugee status is first assessed. If it is a negative decision on refugee status, their application is then assessed for whether they meet the conditions for subsidiary protection. And if it is a negative decision is reached on both aspects of the international protection application, then the file is considered under this section 49 permission to remain category of whether the person should be granted um, permission to remain on effectively humanitarian grounds. So this is one of the umbrella um, humanitarian ground type categories that Tatiana mentioned that we see in, in many of the member states that participated in, in this in this study. So um, it is important I suppose to note that the procedure does guard against there was concern I think that perhaps um, there could be down tariffing in that low, lower forms of status might be granted. Um, a person's application must first be assessed for refugee status and subsidiary protection and only where both statuses are refused does the file then pass for consideration under section 49 permission to remain. If the decision is made by the Minister for Justice to refuse the application for permission to remain, there is no appeal possible against that decision. Uh, what happens at that stage is that the person having now been refused both refugee status and subsidiary protection and also the permission to remain, they then have the right to make a protection appeal under Irish law, but that doesn't include the permission to remain because this is uh, separated out from the protection procedure at that point in, in the statutory framework. Um, if the protection appeal is also refused then by the International Protection Appeals Tribunal, the person has a final opportunity within five days of the refusal of their protection claim to make any further representations to the Minister in terms of new information or change of circumstance that might be relevant to the permission to remain. So it's not a full review as such, but there is an opportunity to bring any additional information to the Minister's attention, uh, which may result in, in a grant of permission to remain at that stage. So we have um, a number of graphs here on this slide and on the following slides. Um, here we have the data that we included in the national report on the profile of persons granted permission to remain under section 49 of the 2015 Act um, for 2017, 2018 and 2019. And you can see that we've, for each of those years, included the, um, the countries which reflected the most commonly granted um, categories uh, of, of permission to remain under section 49 but obviously there were uh, there's a, a huge number of nationalities these are simply the five most commonly granted in each of those countries 
um, if we, in each of those years, if we move on to the next slide then, um, we have also broken down the data for 2017, 2018 and 2019 by um, the age profile of persons who were granted permission to remain. And then the, the next slide is uh, breaking down the data on, on the persons who were granted permission to remain by gender during each of those years. So that's the determination procedure and the pathway for the grant um, of permission to remain. If a person is granted permission to remain under Section 49, the legislation is largely silent on the rights that are associated with that permission. Um, this is, as Tatiana mentioned, an area very much characterised by discretion, not just in Irish law, but also in many other member states. Um, so the legislation doesn't address, for example, the duration of the permission to remain that a person uh, should be granted if they succeed in obtaining permission to remain under Section 49. That's ultimately a matter of ministerial discretion, uh, both as to the, the duration of the permission and also the type of permission, uh, which is very important because many of the subsequent rights will depend on the, the type of permission that the person has obtained. Now, while the legislation is silent uh, as to the, the type of permission in practice, we know that persons who are granted permission under Section 49 are granted a Stamp 4, which is effectively one of the most uh, extensive types of permission in Irish law, which does allow, for example, uh, a right of, of application uh, for um, medical care, for social assistance. Um, again, this is an area where there are some discrepancies perhaps between the formal legal framework, um, for example, in relation to access to accommodation, uh, the, the, the relevant circular that's in operation doesn't in fact refer to this category because it predates uh, the introduction of the 2015 Act. But again, uh, as part of the study, we were informed by the relevant uh, local authorities that they do include persons who were granted permission to remain under Section 49 uh, as eligible to uh, apply for accommodation where necessary. Uh, there are no specifically targeted orientation and integration supports for this particular category on a standalone basis, unlike those that Sarah mentioned, but um, there is obviously eligibility to apply for any general uh, integration or orientation supports that might be available, but not specifically targeted at this category. Family unification, again, is something Sarah mentioned, and again, this is an area where there is no statutory right um, of family unification for persons granted permission to remain under Section 49. It is possible to apply to the Minister for Justice for uh, under what's called the policy document. The INIS has a policy document on non-EEA family reunification, but it generally involves the application of financial thresholds, uh, which wouldn't apply to international protection holders, for example. So um, there's no right of family reunification, although a person could, can always apply to the Minister uh, as part of that discretionary scheme to permit family members to, to enter and join them. Uh, and then in terms of travel, a person who has been granted um, permission to remain uh, can apply for a travel document um, if it's not possible for them to obtain their own national travel uh, passport and, and efforts will generally have to be made to obtain those national documents and to demonstrate why uh, the, the Minister for Justice in Ireland should grant one of those documents to a holder of uh, permission to remain under Section 49. Um, so that's the Section 49 procedure. It's a relatively new feature in Irish law because although it was part of the International Protection Act of 2015, that actually wasn't brought into force until the end of 2016. And as Sarah has mentioned, the first um, permissions were only granted under this heading in 2017. So uh, it's still, as I say, a relatively new feature in our legal framework. Um, if we move to the next slide, then uh, a much more established um, national status in this area is what's called Section 3 Leave to Remain. This arises under Section 3 of the Immigration Act of 1999. Um, unlike Section 49, which is part of the protection process, the Section 3 Leave to Remain really only arose at the very end of the process. It was part of the deportation procedure, effectively, where a person, um, for example, had been unsuccessful in their application for international protection, um, the Minister for Justice might issue a proposal to deport to say, well, this person has no permission to, to, to be in Ireland, they haven't uh, been granted international protection. And the procedure where the Minister for Justice is, is considering whether to make a deportation order under Section 3, he or she notifies the individual that, it, that there is a proposal to make a deportation order and invites that person to submit written representations within 15 working days as to any reasons why they should not be um, made the subject of a deportation order. And again, this is very much in the area of discretionary decision making. 
Um, the criteria that are set out in the legislation that the minister has to consider include the personal circumstances of the person, the nature of their connection to the state. It does also expressly refer to any humanitarian considerations that may apply. And so sometimes section three is, is referred to as humanitarian need from name because it does include, it, it does expressly include uh, consideration of any humanitarian issues. Um, the power to make a deportation order under Section 3 must also be exercised uh, in accordance with the principle of non refoulement which Tatiana, I think, spoke about and also we heard in the video. And so if, as part of the examination of a person's representations, the minister is of the view that to deport that person may breach the um, refoulement principle, then uh, the person may have to be granted leave to remain under this section also. But I suppose, to some extent, the Section 3 procedure will now um, become somewhat less significant in Irish law because of the introduction of the Section 49 procedure and the Section 49 procedure will now apply to most of those applicants who have um, been unsuccessful in their applications for international protection. There will remain a cohort, a separate cohort in, in Irish law who may find themselves the subject of a proposal to deport and who may, who may ultimately be successful in obtaining leave for remain on a humanitarian ground under Section 3 but I think uh, it's, le it's likely to be as I say, somewhat less uh, of a feature in the landscape because of the more uh, recent reforms under the Section 49 procedure. So again, we um, included in the national report data on uh, the most commonly granted uh, nationalities uh, who were granted permission to remain under Section 3 of the 99 Act from 2010 to 2018. Uh, again, with a focus on the five most commonly granted nationalities, but acknowledging that there is a very wide variety of nationalities who were granted um, leave to remain under Section 3. Uh, and again, we've also disaggregated the data in the next slide, um, broken down by uh, the numbers of, of people granted Section 3 leave to remain uh, who are over 18 and under 18. Unlike some member states, Ireland doesn't have a specific uh, category of, of leave to remain for unaccompanied minors. But we can see here, for example, that the power has clearly been exercised um, on a yearly basis uh, to grant permissions to persons under the age of 18, some of whom will likely have been unaccompanied. And then the next slide again disaggregates the data by, by gender between the years 2010 and 2018. We didn't have, I think, the data for 2019 at the time uh, we finalised the national report, so that the, the, these figures only, uh, only go up to 2018. So that's the, the determination procedure. Um, for a person who is granted... Patricia, can you take about three more minutes? Yes, no problem. Great. For a person granted Section 3 leave to remain, um, again, this is heavily discretionary decision-making by the Minister for Justice. The rights aren't generally included in the legislation. Um, but as a matter of practice, uh, we know that um, the Minister tends to grant either a, a Stamp 3 or a Stamp 4 to a person who's granted this permission. That can have a very significant impact on, on all of the, the following rights then in terms of access to accommodation, social assistance, medical care and so on because a stamp three holder has a more limited right to engage in work for example and to, to, to seek social assistance. Uh, and, and there is a lack of clarity I suppose there are no publicly uh, available guidelines that tell us the, the reasons why a person may be granted a stamp three rather than a stamp four and um, so that, that is something I think that can cause some difficulty in practice for individuals and, and those who are advising them. Again, there's no um, right, statutory right to family unification for this category, although it's possible to make an application uh, under the policy document that I've already mentioned. And in terms of um, education, this was an area where there was a difference in treatment between Section 3 and Section 49, um, particularly in the area of access to third level education. Uh, a person who was granted leave to remain under Section 3 was eligible for um, student support and access to third level uh, in terms of free fees initiative, but that wasn't extended to Section 49 permission to remain holders. And it was difficult, I suppose, on a policy basis to understand the reason for that difference in treatment. But if we move down to the next slide then, we can see um, very recently that difference or that disparity in treatment has been remedied by the student support regulations of 2020, which now provides that both uh, Section 49 permission to remain holders and Section 3 leave to remain holders have the same right of access to third level education support and that's very much I think to be welcomed. But we do find I think there are still some disparities between the different groups depending on the type of national status that they're granted and uh, because this is such a heavily discretionary area we see I think sometimes differences in treatment that are not necessarily uh, the, the basis for those differences in treatment aren't necessarily clear which can have a significant impact on the right uh, to, to access various other rights such as as I said the right to work uh, and social assistance. 
So I'd be delighted to take questions or comments from anybody. Um, thank you very much. Great, thanks so much for that, Patricia. Uh, I, I should have said at the outset, of course, that you're um, with Trinity College Dublin, so it's always a great pleasure in the Institute uh, for us to work with our, our, our colleagues in, in Trinity, and uh, especially in the context of EMN, because uh, obviously in the Institute, we, we think we know lots about economics and sociology and social policy and all those sort of things, but we're uh, by no means legal experts, uh, so your contribution to the work of uh, the EMN in, is, uh, is really appreciated. So that, thanks again, and thanks for a really good presentation. And again, thanks to you too, Sarah. Okay, so slight change of pace then. Uh, I said at the outset that we always try and involve uh, policymakers and NGOs and, and such people. And we're very, very fortunate this morning uh, to have uh, contributions from uh, two ideal people. Uh, so I believe Evelyn Byrne should be on the phone line. Are you there, Evelyn? I am indeed, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so as many of you know, uh, Evelyn is the director of the Irish uh, Refugee Protection Programme, and uh, the, the title of the presentation is really neat. It's just a, an update on the Irish Refugee Protection Programme. So you've got a, a, about 10 minutes, uh, Evelyn. I'll give you a, a sort of a two-minute warning at the end, uh, but you're, you're very welcome, and thanks so much for accepting the, our uh, invitation to speak this morning. Very good, and apologies for the difficulties in, in the, the technical difficulties. So I'm going to have to speak to you without you seeing me, but, but we, we'll manage fine. So really, the the, the first slide, and <clears throat> I'm being assisted in this by Evie, who's going to have to try to to, to follow the slides. Um, the IRBP was set up in 2015, and if we if we think back to um, the background against which it was uh, set up, it, it was a time of high anxiety around Europe. Um, uh, people on beaches in Greece and Italy, and it was a time when it became obvious to governments all around uh, Europe that the status quo couldn't exist, that there was a need for a greater engagement with the whole process of welcoming and integrating refugees into their countries, and also taking pressure off some of the countries like Greece and Italy, uh, where people had been arriving and where there wasn't the capacity uh, to manage the numbers that, that were arriving. So in answer to that, the Irish government set up the Irish Refugee Protection Programme. And it's probably true to say that that's really the first time that issues of refugees and asylum really came to public notice in Ireland. Uh, until then, there had been specialist organisations, very aware of international issues. But the general public in Ireland hadn't hugely engaged with the refugee crisis, but they certainly were very shocked and moved by the things that they were seeing on their television. From that time, then, the, the government has increased its commitment to the refugee programme and uh, the team in the Department of Justice and other departments um, play very significant roles in various aspects, which I, I'll talk about now. Um, under IRPP1, which finished in December uh, of last year, the commitment was made to uh, accept 4,000 people under two mechanisms, under the resettlement and relocation mechanisms. The relocations were to be from Greece and Italy. There were some difficulties uh, on the Italian side and therefore um, Ireland concentrated on relocating from Greece. The Irish Refugee Protection Programme was set up. The programme was set up in order to ensure a whole of government approach. Uh, the idea behind the Irish Protection Programme what if every department would be involved, that it wouldn't simply be a matter of justice or foreign affairs, but that each department and government would take a role in providing uh, what was required for refugees coming. Um, when, uh, and I know I'm speaking to, to, to people here who are very aware of the system, but just to remind everybody that uh, it is done by way of government decision, um, then a task force oversees the Irish Refugee Protection Programme, it's overseen by the Minister of State in the Department of Justice and Equality, and it's implemented by the Integrated Service Delivery Team in the Department of Justice. The role of the Integrated Service Delivery Team is to liaise with the various stakeholders, whether they're government departments, whether it's NGOs or the local authorities who are delivering the housing and the services on the ground. So we're now in phase two of um, the IRPP and I don't think any of us thought that phase two of the IRPP would begin in the kind of uh, circumstances in which began. We started the year with um, great enthusiasm. Um, we went to Beirut, having agreed our files with the UNHCR. We went to Beirut to select 
400, 400 people was, was our, our aim. Unfortunately, uh, coronavirus had other ideas, and while we were in Beirut, we were informed that the Lebanese government was closing the airport, like uh, countries all around the world, and we were advised that we would have to come back to Ireland. Um, I would have to um, thank my colleagues in UNHCR and IOM who worked with my colleagues uh, in the Department of Justice to up the ante as fast as we could in the last 24 or 48 hours to interview as many people as we could before we left the country. So we succeeded uh, in interviewing uh, a large group of people and they have been cleared by security in Ireland for travel to Ireland. So as soon as uh, the uh, restrictions are lifted, the COVID restrictions that is, um, we will be able to ensure that those people um, travel from Lebanon where clearly the circumstances in which they're living are extremely difficult. So for those who, who, who like figures, um, the commitment by the Irish government is between 2020 and 2023 to uh, welcome up to 2,900 refugees and that will be uh, through a combination of resettlement and, and community sponsorship. We are largely going to accept refugees from the countries of Jordan and Lebanon, but we will also begin a pilot program in Ethiopia. Part of the reason why it's good to have refugees coming to Ireland from the same country is that when they arrive in Ireland and they are staying in Iraq, it allows us to organise the Iraq to suit the cultural, religious, uh, food, etc. requirements of people coming in because there is already a lot of cultural adjustment for them in that early period. The EC provide funding um, for each refugee that comes to a European country and in, uh, in the case of Ireland, we will receive 9 million between uh, for the, the resettlement of these uh, refugees um, between 20 and 21. That isn't, of course, the full cost of the programme, but that is the European contribution. Um, community sponsorship Ireland was mentioned earlier. It's um, a programme which I think has a lot of potential, particularly in allowing people uh, in communities who want to do more than simply contribute financially, but who want to engage in the welcoming of refugees to Ireland. Essentially, the programme uh, allows a group of people in a community to come together in a community sponsorship group. That group is assisted and guided by regional support organisations, NASC, Irish Red Cross, um, Irish Refugee Council, etc. Uh, those are groups who have expertise in issues of refugee welcome and, and uh, sort of international issues. Um, the RSO guide the community sponsorship group. It is the responsibility of the group to find housing, to source a local school place, um, to introduce the family to communities. But they are, of course, supported by the various services. And the refugees who come through the community uh, sponsorship program are entitled to exactly the same rights as uh, refugees who are coming through the more traditional um, resettlement program. So far, the, the, the findings from it have been very good, not just uh, from the, the refugees, but also from the communities uh, who feel themselves that, uh, in many cases, they have even got more from the experience um, than uh, the refugees have. We began, uh, from the start, monitoring and evaluating the program, and our monitoring and evaluation uh, program has informed programs in, in Germany, Denmark and other countries. Um, it, it is a program which started in Canada, but I think it appeals very much to the volunteering tradition that is in Ireland. Um, and we have about 10 groups at the moment waiting to, to welcome groups. And unfortunately, um, again, the, the virus um, has put a, a halt to that. But what is lovely to, to hear is the phone calls coming from communities around Ireland asking, have you heard anything from the families? Are they okay? Is there anything they can send to Lebanon in the meantime? So it's a, it's a really unique way of allowing people to engage in uh, uh, what is a world problem ultimately. Just a little bit about what has happened to date. Um, we received in uh, 2019 955 people. A key problem for us, obviously, in Ireland is the issue of housing. Um, and it is uh, the issue of housing which dictates the speed at which we can allow people to come to the country because we are limited in the amount of spaces that we have in our era. 
and clearly we need people to move into the community uh, if we are going to have space in New York to allow people to travel from Lebanon and Jordan. As a result of that, um, uh, a lot of the arrivals last year happened between September and December. Um, so it was all hands on deck, but by the time we got to December of last year, we were only short of 700, or sorry, 772 um, people from the number of resettlement that had been promised. It was a promise that 1985, 1,985 people would arrive to Ireland through the resettlement program. Uh, 1,917 have arrived. Part of the issue there also was the unrest, which um, if you can remember last autumn in the U.S. there was um, some unrest in, the, in Lebanese society. And as a result, uh, it was not possible to have a selection mission. But, those people were introduced to the Mars mission and, and will now travel um, as soon as we can bring people in after the summer. In terms of other parts of the program, the relocation concluded uh, in 2018. In terms of IHAP, while people are granted the right to come to Ireland, um, we don't have a record necessarily of when they arrive because that is arranged directly with the family member who has uh, applied to bring them to Ireland. So far, about 160 people have arrived through IHAP, and about 113 people arrived through various search and rescue and unaccompanied minor things. The, the system uh, of um, selection and travel to Ireland. Um, is clearly a very important for the refugee. For that reason, Ireland is quite unique insofar as the entire journey is overseen by one team, which essentially means that a refugee will meet uh, members of the Department of Justice in Beirut or Amman, um, will have an interview, and it's very much a two-way interview. It's, it's an interview for um, the Irish team to satisfy themselves that the family has the capacity and the willingness to adapt to life in Ireland, but it's also an opportunity for families to decide if the culture in Ireland is really a culture in which they, they want to begin a new life. And there are times when families will decide or talking with the team that perhaps no, they, they might prefer to, to travel to another country. So the interview is an extremely important um, part of the process. When the families uh, arrive in Ireland, again, they're met by the same team, which allows a, a continuity of the journey. They are uh, transported to uh, emergency reception centres. There are two full centres, one in Connell and Waterford, one in Ballard in the North Common. And the IRPPP also has bases in the modern accommodation centre. The families stay in the Iraq for around six months. It, it can be shorter or a little bit longer, depending on the needs of the family. If the needs of the family are very specific, it can take longer to, to find necessary accommodation, particularly if accommodation has to be adapted for disability or, or other needs. Families are then resettled in communities around the country. Um, each county has an allocation which was agreed um, back in 2017 and now will be re-agreed among the counties as to where the resettlement will take place. Each county, when it's um, arranging resettlement, will ensure that they have a resettlement officer and an intercultural worker to work with the family, ensuring that they are able to access services locally, that they manage to integrate with communities, and will encourage them to, to, to join in local activities. Um, most uh, of the refugees will have that service for about 18 months. And then finally, they can. Um, they are free to, to apply for citizenship. Evelyn, I hate to interrupt, but uh, can, can you take about another two minutes? I'm just eager to make sure we have time for Enda's uh, contribution. Will do, yeah. So Very as good. you can see from that slide, it's, a, it's, it's quite a young cohort that we have coming, large percentage of children uh, in the group. The current situation at the moment, we have 100 families in Iraq, but of those, 60 have houses waiting for them in communities. Very frustrating for both the counties and the families to know that there are empty houses sitting waiting for them in the country, and we're just waiting for COVID-19 to pass to be able to um, move them. 227 people, security cleared, I mentioned those earlier on, and we will have 768 people to be offered resettlement by June of next year. Okay. 
Challenges, well, COVID obviously, long-term housing, capacity to, to, to welcome new arrivals. Language acquisition is a big challenge for people and obviously then that, that has a knock-on effect for employment activation, etc. And, and the slide is always important, I think, to end with because we can get very caught up in statistics and, and uh, we just need to remind ourselves constantly that it is human beings who have had extremely traumatic lives that we're dealing with. Um, and uh, many of you will have known Dermot Early, the Chief of Staff of Irish Defence Forces. Um, they talk a lot about heroes nowadays, he was certainly one of them. And um, you can see there on the slide, your attitude is more important than your ability, your motives more important than your methods, and your courage more important than your cleverness. I think that any of us who are working with refugees in Ireland just remember that, that at the end of the day, it's not about living a service, statistics or anything else, it's about caring as a human being. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ellen. Really uh, appreciate the presentation and uh, and the, trying to work around uh, the technology in the way you did. So uh, really, uh, really appreciate it. So our last speaker then this morning is Enda O'Neill, who's head of the uh, office here of the uh, UNHCR. And uh, well, Enda's going to give the, the, the highly topical talk on uh, protection in Ireland and the EU implications of COVID-19. So uh, I think you had 10 minutes uh, and in fairness to you, uh, everybody else stole an extra couple, so I might be generous and allow you about 12 minutes. Um, and uh, we'll uh, see then, do we have a, a little bit of time towards the end for, for, uh, for, for questions? We'll, we'll try and get at least about five or so minutes anyway for questions at the end. So over to you, and That's great. Uh, thanks very much, Alan. Uh, so uh, I'll try and be brief today. It's obviously a huge topic. Uh, in the chat box, I've posted a few links. Uh, because I'm not doing a presentation today, so if people are looking for uh, more detail and data, you can find them in the, the documents that I've linked to there. So what I'll try to uh, touch on basically is a summary of some uh, key considerations uh, around access to the territory, uh, the maintaining of basic registration and documentation, access to asylum procedures, uh, reception arrangements and access to healthcare, um, and the changing protection conditions in the region, countries of origin are in transit. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover those in any details, but uh, I'll try to point to some uh, key trends and things to, to look out for. So in terms of access to the territory, uh, the pandemic has required states to implement uh, exceptional measures uh, for public health reasons. These measures are in everyone's interest, including asylum seekers and refugees, but they can have serious impacts on practical access to the territory for people in need of international protection. So across Europe, most countries have imposed either a temporary travel ban or an actual border closure as part of their COVID-19 responses. The uh, suspension of international flights and internal movement restrictions are also practical limits to access to the territory. Um, so, in terms of recommendations to states, UNHCR would recommend that where medical screenings or testings or quarantine measures are in place, that they're done in a non-discriminatory manner and in line with uh, World Health Organization and National Health Authority guidance. Where mandatory quarantine is in place, again, this should be implemented in a non-discriminatory and proportionate manner um, as a measure to monitor potential symptoms and ensure the early detection of the virus. Where bans or border closures are implemented, uh, there should be an explicit exemption for asylum seekers to guarantee access to the territory. Um, and these can be complemented with health measures such as mandatory quarantine where required. So just looking at, at how this has panned out in practice, uh, the European uh, Commission's communication of the 16th of March um, asked for states to ex explicitly exempt uh, from entry bans, persons who are seeking international protection. So that was, I think, very helpful. And we have seen uh, quite wide um, application of that guidance by states. Um, since late April, we've started to see measures being eased across Europe. Um, however, those aspects which um, have the greatest impact on access to the territory, uh, i.e. border restrictions and limitations of freedom of movement, um, are for the most part still in place. Um, so as you'd expect, we have seen uh, quite a reduction in the number of new applications across Europe. Um, in the EU plus region, so far in 2020, 
Uh, the latest figures, figures are about uh, 170,000, over 170,000 uh, international applications, which would be down a third from the same period last year. Um, similarly, in Ireland, uh, we see the same trends. Uh, we haven't had border closures, and, and during the lockdown, we've had a relatively open policy, but INIS have uh, suspended temporarily the application of visas. We know that the uh, traffic in Dublin Airport is down by over 90%. So um, obviously that's gonna have a noticeable impact. From January to March, the number of new applications was um, 729, um, which would represent a 35% decrease on the previous year. Since then, however, um, the, the latest figures that I have are approximately 130 uh, to cover April and May to date. Uh, now, I don't know the extent to which those statistics, there might be a lag in those statistics because of remote working uh, arrangements, but um, were that to ultimately be uh, validated, that would represent a significant reduction over April and May compared to 340 and 384 um, in April and May last year, respectively. So in terms of the process itself, um, registration documentation of asylum seekers is a very important aspect because often it's essential to either have legal stay or to establish legal stay and to access services. So uh, wherever possible, uh, these should be maintained. Um, this can require obviously enhanced hygiene measures for in-person registration. Um, and the, the process might need to be simplified uh, or shortened in order to safeguard uh, staff and asylum applicants. Um, the issuance or extension of documents and residency cards, of course, can also be fully automated or done by post or by distance. So uh, in practice uh, across Europe, we have seen the temporary suspension of registration in a number of countries, uh, Cyprus, Hungary, Poland, Slovenia, Spain um, at times. So concerns over access also exist in other countries. Uh, France and Italy have been mentioned, for example. Um, and the inability to register an asylum claim can result in the lack of access to safe reception conditions, uh, accommodation, healthcare, and education. Uh, on this topic in Ireland, uh, the International Protection Office has continued to register new applications during the lockdown period. Um, the, uh, the office at Timberlay House has been open every day uh, from 11 to 2, Monday to Friday, and temporary residence cards, uh, certificates, um, the renewal and, and callbacks are, are continuing to be issued and done automatically by post. So um, that's positive in, in the national context. On to access to procedures. Um, this is obviously a much more difficult one uh, in comparison to registration and the pandemic has resulted in the widespread, widespread suspension of asylum procedures um, across Europe. Um, this obviously leads to concerns then about the creation of backlogs. So um, UNHCR has recommended a couple of possibilities uh, depending on the national context. So uh, firstly, uh, where procedures can be adapted uh, so as to continue processing of, of claims that should be done. Um, this can be through physical ad uh, adaptations in the building, um, sufficient spacing, hygiene standards, plexiglass, things like that. Uh, medical screening, temperature checks, um, information, uh, questionnaires on symptoms, that kind of thing. Uh, remote interviewing process can also be considered. This has been the practice in some countries already. Um, Sweden, for example, has done it for, for many years. Um, and Ireland has had begun some uh, interviewing uh, by video in the last few years. So that's something that can be considered as well. Uh, equally, where it's not considered feasible or safe to continue processing claims, the time can still be used uh, productively uh, for backlog management. So um, claims that have been progressed to a certain st a stage where there's been a personal interview, for example, those decisions can be finalized, positive decisions can be formally issued, negative decisions can be prepared. Um, they shouldn't be formally issued where appeal pr procedures and timelines and things like that uh, cannot be um, kept to or where it's uh, essentially inaccessible for um, the people concerned to, 
to exercise their right to an effective remedy, but they can be finalized um, and held off on uh, for notification purposes until a point where uh, those appeal procedures are once again um, available. So in the case where that is being done, um, where asylum procedures resume, the formal issuance and notification of the withheld negative decision should be staggered. Uh, if that's not done, it will uh, has the potential to overwhelm uh, procedures, um, legal aid providers, things like that. And equally, um, the time can be used strategically in terms of uh, backlog uh, management. So this could be the analysis of the, the backlog caseload, um, planning for additional processing capacity, um, consideration of accelerated simplified procedures, that kind of thing. So in Ireland, uh, interviewing has been uh, suspended until uh, future notice, um, but I am aware that work is underway to try and um, establish how and uh, when they can recommence. Uh, draft decisions have, uh, preparation of decisions have continued, some positive decisions have issued, um, but negative decisions haven't been um, issuing of late. And in Europe, uh, we have seen some indications that countries are uh, recommencing the processing uh, of claims and with personal interviews. So uh, Norway has been doing it since the 3rd of April via Skype. Um, Sweden has been doing it via video conference as well, as, as has Denmark, uh, Germany and Romania have uh, recommenced some personal interviews. So we're starting to see that happening in Europe. So uh, onto the final couple of topics, uh, as these are massive topics, I can't really cover them in any detail. So I'll just try to point to a couple of things. And Alan, you can cut me off if I'm uh, rabbiting on. So in terms of reception arrangements and access to, to healthcare, this is one that's obviously um, been the subject of a lot of scrutiny in Ireland. Um, and as uh, we've, we've seen a lot of debate um, in detail around the uh, conditions in direct provision. Um, I suppose we have to say from the outside, collective centres, transit centres, these kind of things pose particularly ch particular challenges in terms of physical distancing and hygienic measures. Um, and that's a concern, not just for the inhabitants, but also for the wider community, of course. Uh, we're not safe unless everyone's safe when it comes to the transmission of a virus. So um, this is one that people from the outset of the pandemic were very concerned about. Um, in terms of measures that can be adapted, again, you'll be familiar with a lot of them. Uh, it's the uh, decongestion of uh, centres, uh, provision of additional space, installations of plexiglass shields, regular cleaning, disinfection, uh, enhanced sanitization, water and hygiene measures, these kind of things. Um, uh, persons, older persons and people with pre-existing uh, pre medical con uh, conditions being moved to alternative accommodation. Um, so in terms of how this is looked over uh, across Europe, um, there are concerns around asylum seekers and refugees living in informal settlements or in destitute homeless conditions. Um, possibilities to maintain sanitation and hygiene are very limited in these settings. Um, aggravated economic conditions across Europe uh, are leading to social protection concerns uh, being on the rise. In other situations in other countries where reception conditions were already a concern, so Cyprus, France, Greece, Italy, Malta and Spain, uh, the present circumstances compound the situation and the shortages of reception, safe reception spaces um, and the overcrowding aggravates health risks. Um, thankfully, uh, people's worst fears haven't been borne out to date. Um, the first COVID-19 cases amongst um, the uh, the inhabitants of the islands in Greece were confirmed in early May, but uh, thankfully appear to be uh, to have been contained. Um, 205 people uh, that were the latest figures I've seen uh, from Greece in general uh, of positive cases amongst the, the population of concern there. Um, but considering the numbers of people there and the size of the country, um, uh, I think that's positive and it seems to be uh, under control for the most part. So. Um, the Irish context is obviously uh, something that uh, has been in the newspapers for, for a long time and uh, was the subject of the Oireachtas debates the other day. So I won't go into too much detail here, but just to mention the latest figures that were 
uh, given in, in the Dáil hearing the other day was that of the 7,700 residents of direct provision, uh, 2,700 tests were conducted of which 180 uh, were positive. Um, and of those 13, of those people were hospitalized and there were no intensive care admissions or deaths. So um, it would appear for the most part that the virus has been effectively suppressed in the population um, in centers in Ireland. Uh, but I suppose if you listen to the experts, they say that a second wave or future waves are, are very likely. So this is likely to be an ongoing conversation and one that um, will need to be given uh, considered an ongoing attention. So just to finish then on the, the general regional outlook, um, I gave you a link there to the operational portal for the Mediterranean, It'll give you a sense of the, the arrivals so far this year, relatively manageable in comparison to previous years, uh, over uh, 23,000. Um, it, it continues to be subject to quite a bit of fluctuation. For example, the number of individuals departing Libya um, between January and April this year had increased by 290% on the previous year. Search and rescue continues to be a thorny issue. Both Italy, Italy and Malta had declared their ports unsafe for disembarkation due to COVID-19 since um, early April. Um, if you're following closely, um, you, you'll have seen that in Malta, uh, there's a number of rescued uh, migrants there who have been placed on tourist boats, uh, uh, waiting on chartered vessels offshore. Um, Libya's Coast Guard intercepted about 400 Europe-bound migrants uh, over the last few days, bringing the total number of persons intercepted by the Coast Guard to roughly 1,000 so far in May, and we know that Libya is not a safe port of disembarkation. So all of these things uh, continue to present challenges, um, but equally we have seen some positive indications of solidarity, for example, the relocation of unaccompanied minors uh, from Germany, uh, Luxembourg, and hopefully we'll see it uh, to Ireland in the near future as well. Finally, uh, in terms of uh, what's happening in Africa and, and other areas and the drivers of migration, um, and maybe two, two minutes. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, I'll keep this short. Um, so the paper uh, that I shared in the comments there goes into a lot of detail uh, and it is, um, the tone is quite worrying, uh, I'll be honest, but uh, there, there are opportunities as well. So uh, just to give a couple of key uh, uh, kind of figures, uh, violent attacks in, in the Sahel's hotspots from mid-March to mid-April uh, had risen by 37%. The number of IDPs in Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger increased by 370,000 people in March alone. That's 33% uh, increase. So the situation of many refugees and migrants in the area have become precarious. Um, blunt public health measures, broad shutdowns can carry um, high costs for African workers, 85% of whom work in the informal sector. Um, the World Bank estimate that remittances to Africa will decrease by 23% in 2020. Um, there's risks of increased um, xenophobia, uh, hostility towards foreigners as a result of the virus, things like this. So many challenges there, but also opportunities in Europe. The, uh, forthcoming discussions on the new EU Pact on Migration and Asylum are an important opportunity. Germany will take over the presidency of the European Council in the second half of this year. So I think for the rest of the year, we'll have an opportunity to see if Europe has learned the lessons of 2015. And just um, as with the pandemic and the economic recession, we're uh, comparing to 10 years ago and, and the re response to the last um, recession in terms of migration and asylum uh, if we see um, a lot of increased um, displacement we'll be looking to see if Europe has learned the lessons since 2015 and if they can in fact put in place um, a new framework to, to better manage um, solidarity uh, among states in the EU. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Marchenda. Um, now, um, I've got a bit of a dilemma here uh, because we're about seven minutes over time and um, we, we have a number of, of, of questions uh, in, but I'm, I'm going to do the, the, the following. 
Um, I think because we have the questions written down, this is kind of handy. Uh, I'm going to propose that uh, maybe the uh, participants could, could deal with, with the, the questions uh, by posting responses on the ESRI website uh, later on, where we have the, the conference uh, event. Uh, because there, there, there is a degree of detail uh, in them, and I think it's, it can be difficult for people uh, to sort of stay with a, uh, a webinar for, for that length of time. But I would like to just ask quite a, a, a broad general question uh, of all the participants, and they, they can uh, take a, a minute uh, on it. And here's my question. Uh, the COVID crisis has sort of called into question uh, how we do a whole range of things, okay? So it calls into question how we do education, how we do seminars, um, how we do healthcare in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, so as if COVID has really sort of shaken uh, how, how we do things uh, to its foundations. And uh, I have to say, as a sort of a non-specialist in the area of asylum and protection, uh, I do wonder in Ireland, I mean, is it the case that our sort of direct provision system is sustainable in a, in a COVID context? Is this one of these areas of policy uh, that is simply going to have to change, uh, that we could try and, try and tweak it, uh, or, or we could just look at it much more fundamentally? Uh, so I'd like to put that question, if I may, uh, to each of, uh, of the folks. So uh, I don't know, Tatiana, do you want to take a sort of an international uh, perspective on it, you don't even have to talk about the Irish one, but I mean, internationally, uh, is, is the way uh, we sort of process asylum seekers and, and refugees is it fundamentally altered in a, in a COVID context? Um, well, I think um, um, Enda's uh, last point was <laughs> going towards that direction. So um, I think uh, within the Yemen, we are working towards also uh, trying to to summarize a bit um, what what has happened um, with uh, with the COVID, what um, you know, what are the responses? So this is was this is also one of uh, EMN's um, function to also you know map what are the answers, and what um, uh, what well the, there's no um, um, there's no um, output uh, yet, but definitely there's <laughs> the the answer can only be yes at the moment. We have uh, we have seen a lot of um, of points where uh, COVID has not only changed the procedures, like not only on asylum, uh, but also on other procedures like return. Uh, so just to highlight that COVID has indeed um, has shaken a, a bit of <laughs> a bit of uh, processes uh, throughout Europe and um, not well, the interesting point is that it's not only member states who are, you know, the usual suspects with that we, we think, you know, with the asylum, not only those at the um, the outer, so Italy, Greece, um, but also other member states. So I think it's a very, very general um, concern. So this is a very interesting uh, point to see from a policy perspective, to see how everyone is, is actually concerned with this at the moment. So okay. that, I, I'll leave it to you. Thank, thanks for that. Uh, Sarah or Patricia, do you want to make a, a, a comment? Um, yeah, so Alan, I might um, just respond to that. I think you're right, there has obviously been a focus on direct provision now for many years from many points of view, but this crisis has really highlighted, I suppose, some of the particular difficulties around the use of emergency accommodation and the fact that people are moving quite regularly between different centres, which makes it particularly difficult uh, to, to, to monitor and to limit the spread of a virus that we're dealing with. There's also the issues to do with capacity within the centres, the fact that people who are sharing rooms with people with whom they're not related are nonetheless regarded as a household for the purposes of the HSE guidelines and therefore social distancing and the, the, the ability of individuals in these centres to, 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 to engage in social distancing. And we've seen obviously the particular concerns around Cahar Saivin, both for the residents and for the locals who are concerned that um, COVID was brought to Cahar Saivin by, um, by the, the relocation of, of some asylum seekers from Dublin. So I think we know the, gov the, the government formation at the moment, the, the, the direct provision system itself is up for discussion. And I think this crisis will certainly add another uh, perspective on perhaps the need for reform of the overall system. Great, thanks. I don't know if you want to add Sarah or uh, did Patricia answer on behalf of the team. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, I, I just to add as well, I think um, it's positive to see that at, at, you know, at this time there is on, ongoing developments around uh, looking into um, the future of the application or the international protection system. So the current um, interdepartmental group that's looking at um, the international protection system, you know, would be hopefully taking into account what is going on at the moment and what we can learn from the pandemic and the impact on um, applicants in the system. 
Uh, thanks for that. I know I, I was going through the the, the speakers uh, in, in order, but Evelyn, I might leave you you give you the last one on this. So, and I know you've addressed uh, my, my question partly in the your presentation, but you wanted to just take a minute to sort of summarise on that point of the, uh, the very you know j just just the question. But in Ireland and elsewhere, do we have to do this thing differently because of COVID? Uh, I, I think in the national context. Uh, the, the reception of asylum seekers and the discussions around it are very different to other countries in Europe. Um, and that, I think, uh, it doesn't necessarily help us that much to consider, to compare ourselves to other countries because uh, we've been talking about this for a long time and we clearly have, there's clearly a political um, will and need to do things differently um, in Ireland that's been continuously expressed for quite some time now. I think that can only happen with uh, kind of wide political support, uh, government support. So it's important that that would be in the programme for government if that is ultimately to be delivered because the complexity of the reception system is that it cuts across many departments. And if you are to have uh, all the different aspects of government um, and, and government services that asylum seekers need to access working better, then you do need coordination and political agreement. Um, as to how you want to proceed. So I hope we will see um, positive uh, recommendations coming out from the advisor group chaired by Catherine Day, for instance, um, and that we will see a clear direction in the programme for government as to what uh, they want to be achieved over the next five years. However, just one caveat, I think we're going to have some very difficult years ahead. Um, and so there needs to be realism about the, the, the system as well and what's achievable. Very good. Thanks for that. So, Evelyn, I'll, I'll leave that last word to you uh, on, on, on the question I raised. Would you like to give us a couple of reflections? Yeah, first of all, on the IRPP, which is my own side of the house, um, COVID has been difficult because Middle Eastern culture is very much about meeting in large family groups, etc. So it has been a very, very difficult time. I would hope that it doesn't lead to a rise in racism. And I would hope that the very good national spirit that has been shown during COVID-19 will continue. I'm always very concerned about engaging with refugees by uh, Zooms and by uh, remote interviewing, etc., because I think there's very little that will replace the face-to-face -face connection. So I'm hoping that in that sense, the goodwill of COVID will continue, racism won't, and that when we get over COVID, we can get back in some senses to a programme that is working well in terms of the Irish Refugee Protection Programme. In terms of, of direct provision, um, I think, first of all, it's a debate that sometimes has to be held in, in a more um, widespread way. Talking about, you know, refugee or uh, asylum seekers bringing COVID to Cahar Saizin or whatever, does nothing to help the people who are trying to live in the direct provision centres. The reality is there are a large number of people who come to Ireland to seek asylum who do not have accommodation and accommodation has to be provided by the state. Nobody is saying that the situation that is currently there is ideal. We've already had the uh, standards, the national standards for uh, accommodation written up. The Catherine Day Committee is looking at it. But the reality is, as large numbers come into the state, we have to find accommodation for them. And in a crisis of accommodation, that is a serious challenge for everybody. I think it's wrong to think that in any way there is not the desire at all levels of government, of civil service and of society, to improve the situation for people coming into the country. But pitting um, you know, government against uh, communities, against society, et cetera, is not helpful to the debate. The debate, the important thing is that we look at the standards for the accommodation and that we work as hard as we can and with the resources available to us to improve it. Everybody wants to offer the proper welcome to people who have found a reason to have to flee their own country. Okay, thanks for that, Evelyn. Um, I think I should really need to bring things to a, a close now because that we've uh, we have run a little bit over time, and I'm conscious uh, that um, it might be tricky for people to stick with it. So uh, anyway, I think it's been a, a really enjoyable morning. I want to thank uh, all the speakers uh, who, who contributed. Uh, apologies that, that the, the, the questions and answers uh, are, are not being answered uh, directly, but as I said, uh, I will talk after uh, we hang up uh, to the, the colleagues uh, to see if, if they're willing to provide uh, emailed answers. 
uh, and then we'll we'll post them on the website uh, later where, where this event is uh, advertised on our our website so um my, my guess is i think when the the crisis kicked off i used to be sort of saying well hopefully the next time we're having one of these conferences uh, we'll be we'll be doing it in person again uh, the longer time goes on uh, the more complicated that seems to be uh, so i was now a suspicion that we'll be doing this uh, from time to time but anyway it's uh, at, at least we are able to sort of stay in touch and exchange uh, ideas and views and information and everything like that. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, just again thank the speakers, thank everybody for logging on and uh, say that hopefully we'll uh, see you all again uh, before too long. Okay, so good morning.